American in Barcelona. Terrorists around the world should know the United States and our allies are resolved to find you and bring you to justice. We'll discuss how the U.S. is fighting the war on terror with Senator Ben Cardin, the top Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee. Plus, as Steve Bannon joins the list of ousted White House staffers, we'll ask our Sunday panel how the shakeup will affect the president's agenda and those who put him in the White House. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello from Fox News in Washington. The president parting ways with his top strategist, Steve Bannon, after a week that saw the president get harsh criticism from both sides after the violence in Charlottesville. So where does the White House go from here? With me now, former Trump deputy campaign manager David Bossy. And David, welcome to Fox News Sunday. Thanks for having me. First appearance as a guest. What took you so long? <laughs> the invitation lost in the mail. Well, listen, it's my <laughs> first time, too, so thank you for being here today. How big of a loss is this for President Trump? Well, you know what? The, the, the president is uh, his own agenda setter. He has been his own uh, strategist for many, many years, and he he, he lets everybody know that. Uh, don't get me wrong. Steve Bannon is an, it was an integral part of the White House, uh, but uh, this president understands how he got elected. He is the one who formulated really the agenda uh, and, and, and the, t the issues that we really ran on. And, and Steve and I, Steve called me uh, in August of last year when, when he took over the campaign and I came and joined. Uh, the campaign in, in late August. So again, I was somebody who came in late, but we helped the president. It was the president's ideas, and this has always been the president's agenda, 100%. For years and years, he's been talking about these issues. Okay, just the other day, the president said this about Steve Bannon. I like Mr. Bannon. He's a friend of mine. But Mr. Bannon came on very late. You know that. I went through 17 senators, governors, and I won all the primaries. Mr. Bannon came on very much later than that, uh, and I like him. He's a good man. That was, that was Tuesday. What changed? I don't think anything's changed. I think every staff member serves at the pleasure of the president. There are different chapters in every presidency, and, and staff changes do occur. I do believe that Steve Bannon is going to be a very loyal soldier to the president as it relates to his agenda from the outside. Now, he is going you, to be you an... Do, you an, do believe that. He, I've talked to Steve many times. He's going to be in a very important voice for the president as it relates to leaning into Congress specifically in trying to really get the failure of leadership in the House and in the Senate uh, to stand up and really take a hold of the president's agenda, which is really, if we're looking at seven months on into this administration, one of the biggest challenges the president's had. The, the, they want it all to be leaning on the president when in fact it's a failure of leadership in the House and Senate. Let me get to that relationship in a moment, but who wanted Bannon out? Well, look, I, you know, the, there's, there are uh, a host, and there has been, and we've all read about and seen about the different factions within the White House staff. And there always is, in every presidency, there are factions. There's no difference here. Uh, and so it, this is not, it's, the one thing that I've learned from Steve in the last couple of days is, in his opinion, for the future, this is not personal to him. This is about the president's agenda and the president succeeding on that winning agenda that got him elected last November. The reason I ask you that, there are reports has been said Secretary Kelly, the new chief of staff, wanted people that only fit into the category that wanted to support President Trump. Did Steve Bannon fit in that category? Well, I, 100 percent. I, I, I don't uh, believe for a minute that Steve Bannon has... Uh, gone against the president's agenda in any way shape, so or form. anyone who so, would anyone who would suggest that he was working no, no, for himself I, look, as opposed to the president would be wrong general kelly obviously the new chief of staff coming in has broad authority to make changes as he sees fit and he's going to continue to do that though he wants to have uh, and, and run a shop that he creates. This is something that the reason that Steve offered his resignation was to give that uh, the, to give the general an opportunity to have a clean slate. I think much like much like uh, uh, Ryan Priebus and Sean Spicer before him. Okay. 
There was an interview late Friday night that Steve Bannon did with the Weekly Standard. In part, he said the following, the Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. We still have a huge movement and we will make something of this Trump presidency, but that presidency is over. What does he mean? I, I specifically believe that he means that Congress has failed. What I was mentioning before, yeah. that that Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan have have to step up, have to give us meaningful tax reform, have to get repeal and replace of, Ob of Obamacare done. A, a host of legislative, uh, uh, you know, accomplishments that the president ran on and won on. The, and as a matter of fact, the reason that Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell are the leaders are because of the issues that President Trump won on. So, okay. So now, we need with to regard get to that, now Bannon said the following also in that interview, the Republican establishment has no interest in Trump's success on this. They're not populist, they're not nationalist, they have no interest in his program, zero. You agree with that? I agree that the that the House and Senate leadership has not bought into the president's agenda fully, and 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 if and I think the the record of of the last seven months uh, bears that out. We we need to have House and Senate uh, uh, leaders come to the to the White House and work with the president on his agenda. Tax reform. Let's just talk about the economy for a moment. Our economy is ready to roll. We, the president has added one million new jobs, no one else. The president, with hope, growth, and opportunity, an agenda, and a, a belief that every American can, can, can have an opportunity in their future, in their children's future. That we have the lowest unemployment rate, 4.3% in over 16 years. The stock market's at the, the Dow's at an all-time high. If we can get meaningful tax reform and tax relief for the American people, this economy is going to be growing at two, three, four percent here very and shortly. The, the last quarter it was at two point six percent. That is the president's doing. That's the president bringing jobs home, getting corporations to want to hire again, stability, getting rid of these ridiculous overburdensome tax uh, 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 regulatory uh, uh, issues that, that the Obama administration just burdened business with. And Republicans in Congress may suggest that the White House has not given the leadership that's necessary Look, to push those issues over sure. uh, the finish line. What Bannon argued in the, in the piece is that the effort on Obamacare was half-hearted. What is the responsibility of the White House to lead on these issues? You know, no one is saying that the president is not leading. I think that they, there's there's a lack of leadership on one side of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, and, and and so look, we want everybody to work together. I, I I do. I want I want the House and the Senate and and the and the White House to work together to get these uh, uh, issues on the table and legislative uh, uh, accomplishments through the House and Senate that the president okay. can be proud of and sign. He also referred to West Wing Democrats. And as you sit here today, there are supporters all across the country. Maybe they're in Pennsylvania, Ohio, sure. Michigan, Wisconsin. And they stood in long lines. Absolutely. And they turned blue counties to red yep. in support of Donald Trump. How much assurance can you give them today that what they worked for will not be thrown away? Oh, well, that's easy. The President of the United States is 100 percent committed to the agenda that he ran on and won on. The agenda of better education, better better jobs, better job opportunities, and repeal and replace Obamacare. To give the American people that hope, growth, and opportunity uh, that, that he promised during the campaign that we have to get done over the next year. Now, remember candidate Trump said he was going to come to Washington, D.C., and he said he was going to, to drain the swamp. Did the, swamp, did the swamp win this week, David? No, 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 no. He, look, the president is fully committed uh, to, to draining the swamp. He is in the throes of that fight right now. But the, the, the swamp, as you drain the water, those, those creatures come out. And that is really what this is about. The president is fighting every day that broken status quo both on both sides of the aisle. The broken status quo that has got us a $20 trillion debt, uh, that we're gonna have to increase the debt ceiling again uh, next month. This is, this is something where we need to have meaningful reforms uh, that the president ran on and won on. And, I, and I'm fully committed to helping him get there. Thank you for being here today. Thank David Bossy, thank you for your time and more to come.
In a moment here, we'll bring in our Sunday group and how Steve Bannon's departure will affect the president's relationship with his base. That's next. You think they're going to give you your country back without a fight, you are sadly mistaken. Every day, every day it is going to be a fight. He is not a racist, I can tell you that. He's a good person. He actually gets a very unfair press in that regard. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Bannon, but he's a good person, and I think the press treats him, frankly, very unfairly. So first there's Steve Bannon addressing CPAC February this past year, then President Trump on Tuesday defending Steve Bannon, but stopping short of offering full confidence here in Washington. Uh, it is time now for our Sunday group. Charles Hurd, opinion editor for The Washington Times, Juan Williams, columnist for The Hill, Bob Woodward from The Washington Post, and former National Security Council staffer Jillian Turner. Good Sunday to all of you, and thank good you for being here here today. President tweeted this yesterday on Steve Bannon. I want to thank Steve Bannon, he writes, for his service. He came to the campaign during my run against crooked Hillary Clinton. It was great. Thanks, S. Bob Woodward, take us inside the West Wing. How does it change now without Bannon? Well, remember, Bannon was the chief strategist, and uh, is the chief strategist uh, he failed because there was no strategy. Uh, a strategy is you have to not just be a word person, you have to be somebody who comes out and says, okay, we're going from here to here, it's going to take time, and this is the plan. And that's not the way Bannon thought. Uh, somebody who would make some very loud declarations ser serve his purpose. It's very interesting and important. General Kelly, as a former four-star uh, is a strategic thinker. You have to be that in the military and you have to have a plan. Now whether it's going to work, we'll see, but that's the idea. Okay, now Charlie, there has been a lot of reaction. Steve King, Republican from Iowa, conservative side, said the following to the Wall Street Journal. Who is going to defend the conservative Republican agenda, he said. We're seeing Democrats and leftists team up with the never Trumpers. It denies the will of the people. It undermines the Republic if election results are not honored. Is he right? I think that uh, I think he absolutely is right, and I think that there is a real concern uh, across the country about just that. But but you know, in terms of Steve Bannon leaving, you know, I, and I think Bob is exactly right in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, Bannon is a disruptor. He's a he's 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 not an insider. He's an outsider. He's very good charging the the uh, the, the gates from the outside, and I think that he will return uh, to doing just that, and and that's why he was very valuable uh, to to Donald Trump in the election. I think he he certainly helped get Donald Trump elected. That's not to say that uh, that he is somehow uh, uh, Trump's brain or anything like that. Donald Trump uh, and and Steve Bannon arrived at the uh, you know in agreement on so many of these issues independent of one another. Uh, but they both believe them, and I think that in that respect uh, the the Trump agenda is in in good hands. The question is, uh, will Republicans on Capitol Hill uh, defend? Okay, just values? just back to the the, the main point there to his base. Did they lose this week? Uh, no, I don't think that they did. I think that they, because Trump is still in the White House, Trump still believes everything that he believed when he ran on the, on, on, uh, in the campaign. We, we, we have seen him uh, uh, hold fast on things like uh, the environment, illegal immigration, uh, international trade. He, he, is, he, he has not wavered on any of those things. So I, no, I don't think that they uh, lost. I think that, that if anything, uh, they uh, may have gained a very loud, powerful voice on the outside who is now unrestrained uh, from uh, you know, White House considerations. Oh, you wonder if he was ever, ever restrained, and Steve Bannon would argue that he, no one's going to restrain him. I thought it was interesting to hear Newt Gingrich with me on Friday morning. Uh, in a bigger picture, a bigger sense for this White House when he said this about President Trump. He's in a position right now where he is much more isolated than he realizes. Uh, on the Hill, he has, he has far more people willing to sit to one side and not help him right now. But he needs to think about what has not worked. And you, you don't get down in the 35% range of approval and have people in your own party uh, shooting at you and, and conclude that everything's going fine. Well, uh, Newt Gingrich came on our program to deliver a message, Juan. Was that message received? I don't know. I think that Newt's pretty close to the president, and I think the president coming on Fox, <laughs> I think the president might be watching. But this is an important message because there are people who are 
enablers, if you will, Bill, for the president who tell him everything's going okay. You're still President Trump. You still have the energy. You still have the agenda. But if you look at things like trade, if you look at immigration, if you look even Bannon wanted said, you know what, we should have higher taxes on the rich. That's not in keeping with so much of the agenda that's in the White House. And it certainly hasn't been satisfied in terms of any legislative accomplishment on the part of this White House. And that's why Newt says you're isolated on the Hill. You're fighting the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. You're having fights with Jeff Flake. Uh, you have Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee, who had been a loyal Trump supporter, coming out and say this president not doesn't look stable, doesn't look like he has the competence necessary going into the fall, going into fights over the size of the debt limit and the budget. These are troubling signs inside the Republican Party for President Trump at this juncture. Uh, there are very interesting pieces already out today about that very topic, Jillian. How do you think this goes from here? Well, I think Speaker Gingrich sort of hit the nail on the head this week when he told you that if the president wants this kind of stability for his administration that Juan is talking about, meaning he's not hemorrhaging key advisors every week, what he needs to do is institute some message discipline. That was the first key thing. The other key thing Speaker Gingrich said to you is that if somehow the president can get the Republican Congress to rally around him, to get in line behind him, everything going forward will be smooth sailing, you know, unicorns and rainbows and things like that. But, but, the, but to me, what the key thing is, is actually right now, first getting the White House in line behind the president to get on board with his message. And I think with Steve Bannon out, the president really has a shot at that maybe for the first time during his presidency, because to me, the hallmark, the calling card of Steve Bannon has been sort of this weaponization of leaked information. That is something that he's certainly not the first person to bring to the White House, but he was able to bring it in an incredibly destructive way so that people felt that just the threat of leaked information was enough to deter them and steer them off course. So if we get rid of that, at least for now, I think the president has a real shot at reigning in the administration. You know, Bobby, think about that. I mean, you, you were with President Bush during one of the lowest points of his presidency, and I'm suggesting this is a low point for, for Donald Trump. We're going to get to that a bit later, but you wrote the book Bush's War. I mean, these were heady times during the Iraq War. Uh, when you listen to Newt Gingrich and talk about the approval rating, whether legitimate or not, how do presidents turn it around? Well, first of all, you have to have something that's a win, as Trump frequently talks about. And the way you get a win is not executive orders. You've got to do something with Congress. And you can't work and get things done if you have a war between Trump and the Republican leaders. Somebody has got to heal that breach. If you don't, you're not going to move forward. And that's where the strategic thinking, sorry, you've got to plan, and if they're going to say, uh, you know, you, you don't get everything you want, so you, they're going to have to pick one or two of these things and try to get them, and Which it's going to be a big... Which well, one do they pick? Uh, uh, tax reform, infrastructure, uh, nominally popular, we'll see, but Trump is going to have to also restrain himself in these tweets, in these statements. He, he needs Please, to wait. be friendly with the Republican <laughs> I thought leader. you were about to say presidential. <laughs> you used a different word this time. No, Go no, ahead, but you need we? to, you, you know, this is about human relations as but everything you're, you're is. But not going to take away the Twitter feed. No, no, and I, and, I don't, and I don't think that that will solve everything either. Um, and certainly the, the president deserves some bit of the blame. But to listen to Juan run through the list of uh, things that people on the Hill have said, it's kind of shocking to, to sit back and think about it. You know, talk about uh, about you know throwing rocks out of a glass house. I mean, these are people who, for seven years, these Republicans for seven years campaigned on uh, repealing Obamacare, and then when they finally got an opportunity to do it, it turns out they have no plan. They have no ability to do it whatsoever. So while they're sitting there criticizing Donald Trump, uh, I think in some cases is unfairly. My goodness, why aren't they taking care of their own business? They've got a lot of problems well, up with, there. With regard to that, Steve Bannon said this in the Washington Post just today. The Republican Party on Capitol Hill gets behind the president on his plans and not theirs. It will all be sweetness and light. Be one big happy family. No administration in history has been so divided among itself about the direction, about where it should go. And that is a loaded quote. Juan? 
Well, I mean, that's why Steve Bannon said is from his perspective, this presidency's over, which is a shocking thing to say. I mean, coming from Steve Bannon and the idea that Bannon now goes on the outside. And I think Bannon will have a large megaphone. I think you're not only Breitbart, but I think he is going to have lots of allies in the conservative media who are echoing the idea that we've got to keep the pressure up on Donald Trump. So right wing talk radio, the media. I don't know. Some, sometimes you look at Drudge, you think Drudge and some people are getting a little antsy about what's going on. But the key for Bannon will be, does he join, let's say, with the Mercers, a very big philanthropic conservative family, and trying to create an even bigger megaphone to force Donald Trump to his agenda again. Well, the other thing Speaker Gingrich said in an interview is the second book that Donald Trump wrote was called The Art of the Comeback. And he suggested in that segment that he should reread it. Uh, that from Speaker Gingrich, who I've referred to, is likely trying to send a message. Panel, hang on. In a moment here, see a little later in our broadcast today. Next, though, after another deadly terror attack in Europe, questions about whether this kind of act can be prevented. The top Democrat in foreign relations, Senator Ben Cardin, will join us live next. is just to look at the gruesome scene on Thursday as a, ma a van rather mowed down many in Barcelona's most popular district. That attack leaving at least 13 dead, including one American, more than 120 injured. Are we getting any better at detecting these attacks before they happen? With me now, the top Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Ben Cardin. Senator, welcome back here to Fox News Sunday. Bill, it's good to be with you. Thank you. I've got a number of things I want to go through in the next 10 minutes or so. Let's move through these as best we can. First, on Spain, uh, it is clear there was a well-established network operating around Barcelona. What can you tell our viewers about your level of confidence about being able to stop these networks before they kill, whether it's abroad or here at home? First, uh, our prayers go out to the families, uh, the, the victims, and we, we hope those that are injured will make a full recovery. Uh, what the Trump administration needs to do is articulate a strategy that uses all the tools in our military and diplomatic toolbox, working with our allies to not just shrink the caliphate of ISIS and related groups, but to stop the exporting of, uh, of terrorism in Europe and beyond. I think we need to have an articulated strategy that is well understood, that uses all of the means. That's our intelligence community, our, our military, uh, our diplomacy, working with our allies so that we can share information. What happened in Spain looks like it was well coordinated. Uh, we need to be better at tracking these well, things down re before they Reports occur. suggest the CIA told authorities in Barcelona two months ago to be on the lookout and, and nothing changed. A house blew up on Wednesday night and still there was no action taken. So what is the level of confidence again whether it's in Europe or here at home, that we're making any progress on this, Senator? Well, you know, when we stop terrorist activities from taking place, these are victories that we don't always report about. When we are not successful, obviously the tragedies that occur, uh, we, we see them on the, on, on the news. Uh, clearly, something was missed here, and we, and we have to find out how that was missed. Uh, the United States, working with our allies, need to make sure that we follow up on the information we have. It's unacceptable to see the signs that we saw in Spain and still the tragedies that took place. Well, this is st uh, still a developing story, and there will be developments throughout the day and uh, the week to come. Let's move to North Korea. Twelve days ago, the president got the world's attention when he said this. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. And then a week later, in fact, this past Tuesday, the North Korean regime said it would not take aim at Guam. The president followed on Wednesday with this tweet. Kim Jong-un of North Korea made a very wise and well-reasoned decision. The alternative would have been both catastrophic and unacceptable. Senator, did the president win this round? 
No, not at all. In fact, I think he accelerated the point. But what we want to do is prevent North Korea from furthering its nuclear weapons program. Obviously, if they take any aggressive actions against the United States or any of our allies, we will respond and protect uh, our, our allies and our, and our country. What we want to do is, is have a diplomatic solution that will pull back North Korea's uh, nuclear program. We have seen no sign of that by what the president has done. We need the unity of the international community. What the president did, I think, jeopardizes our relationship with China in trying to get China to put more pressure on North Korea. Well, apparently so, no, I don't that think he advanced our objective. is underway, and more on that in a moment. But just back to the question. The White House gets no credit for keeping this where it is right now? The White House needs to articulate a North Korean strategy that could, we can work with the international community with the objective of ending the nuclear weapons program in North Korea. That's what our objective needs to be. I want to call this uh, comment from Steve Bannon this past week. He said the following, there's no military solution to North Korea's nuclear threats, forget it. Until somebody solves the part of the equation that shows me that 10 million people in Seoul don't die in the first 30 minutes from conventional weapons, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no military military solution here, they got us. Do we have to accept a nuclear North Korea? No, I don't think we have to accept a, a nuclear North Korea. I do think, and I rarely agree with Mr. Bannon, I think though his point about the military is absolutely accurate. A military solution to North Korea will be catastrophic as far as the casualties involved. What it means is we have to have a different strategy with China. China can, can tur turn the screws on North Korea to a point where North Korea has no choice but to negotiate a changed path in regards to their nuclear program. It starts with a freeze and so then with pull back North Korea wants to protect its regime China can can provide that type of protection without North Korea having a nuclear weapon there are ways to, for this to move forward admittedly it's extremely difficult but it requires us to use diplomacy in a way uh, okay. that strengthens our ties with China I've heard you mention diplomacy several times in 1995 Bill Clinton tried diplomacy and we also offered North Korea 400 million dollars in aid. In 2005, President Bush traded more aid to try and get a deal. We are 22 years later. Can't we admit that diplomacy, Senator, has failed? Well, we certainly have not been successful in a North Korean strategy. There, uh, that is absolutely factually correct. What we do have, though, is a common agenda with China. China does not want a nuclear North Korea, but China does not want a unified Korean peninsula under, uh, uh, under South Korea. So what China and North Korea have in common is the protection of the current North Korean regime. We can work with China because our objective is not to eliminate the regime in North Korea, our objective is to eliminate its nuclear weapon program. If we focus on that, working with China, there is a way forward. It is difficult, but what are the options? What are the other options? Do we allow North Korea to become a nuclear weapon state with unclear as to how they will use that to, to, uh, uh, to go against American values and interests? That's not acceptable. Do we use a military solution where literally hundreds of thousands of people could be killed? That's not a, a feasible solution. So we have to go down the path that gives us the best chance uh, of, uh, of a positive outcome. Okay, on Afghanistan, we may get a decision on this this week. Uh, we know Vice President Mike Pence, H.R. McMaster, favor putting more troops on the ground in Afghanistan. You've been pushing for fewer troops for about six years now. Um, and I, I wonder if you have more in common with the president on that idea than you thought because he appears to be reluctant. There's also this idea out there about putting a private security company to keep watching the terrorists in Afghanistan today. My question is, 16 years down the road, $700 billion spent, is it time to be open to new ideas? Well, I, I don't know if I'm in agreement with the president because I haven't heard what the president's plan is in Afghanistan. I haven't seen an articulated strategy. We have invested a great deal in Afghanistan. Our objective needs to be that we have a regime in Afghanistan that can maintain some semblance of security so that we don't see growing terrorist organizations again within Afghanistan. That's our objective. Should we use private uh, contract troops? Absolutely not. There's no accountability there. That's not the 
purpose for private contractors. No, we should not do that. Uh, should we put more military in? Again, this is not the U.S. fight. I don't believe putting more American soldiers in Afghanistan is the answer. We really do need to work to fill the, the void so voids don't cre are created, are not created, so that there's opportunity for Afghanistan to have a stable central government. Let's come back here in our country now and talk about this monuments debate. It hit quite close to your home state of Maryland. Uh, this past week, right. the president asked the following question about it. This week, it's Robert E. Lee. I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You know, you, all, you really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? Your state of Maryland removed statues in Annapolis and in Baltimore in the middle of the night this past week. Do you think this is the best way to handle history? Well, first of all, I think the president's gotten this all wrong as to ha how what we're trying to do. We're not changing history. We want to learn from history. There's no question about that. That's an important aspect. You don't need a monument to learn history. Monuments are put to, put up for different purposes. Some are more modern than others. M monuments should represent the contemporary needs of our society. And I think what Baltimore did and what Maryland is doing is appropriate. But we will not uh, avoid history, and we certainly want to learn from history. Right, there's a prominent Democratic lawmaker in Maryland, uh, a Democrat who leaves the state Senate. Uh, he was arguing in a letter to your governor, Larry Hogan, this past week, that the addition of a statue is the appropriate way to go, and he suggested the late Justice Thurgood Marshall. And he made the argument the following way, a very public and purposeful compromise to give balance to the state house grounds, recognizing our state and our country have a flawed history. What's wrong with that argument when you consider learning about all of our complex American history, Senator? I want, our, I want our young people to learn from all parts of our history. In Maryland, we have Antietam Battlefield, which is a place where I hope people will go and visit and learn from the, the tragic history of our Civil War. We have the Harriet Tubman National Park, where people can go and learn about the Underground Railroad. We have places in Maryland that I think are critically important to learn the good, bad, and ugly about uh, uh, America's history and our path towards our democratic society. You don't need to have a monument that's a offensive to certain uh, parts of our history being glorified uh, in order to fully appreciate the yeah, history Mike of our Mike Miller's country. making the case we need more monuments. Well, you know, we have lots of monuments uh, that people rarely visit. I think the important point is uh, let's find effective ways so people can understand the struggles of America. And again, I point out the Harriet Tubman National Park. It's a wonderful Understood. place to visit. I'm going to be there later today. All right. Enjoy your visit there. Senator, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Ben Cardin, the Democrat from Maryland. Thank you. Thank you for being here. In a moment, we'll bring back our panel to talk about the president after Virginia. What does he say now? Did he miss a chance to bring the country together? We'll get to all that in a moment. Plus, what would you like to talk to the panel about? Go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we just might use your question on the air. Racism is evil. And those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. So that was President Trump this past week, two different days, first on Monday, then on Tuesday, explaining his point of view after the attacks in Charlottesville and the violence we watched unfold there. Back with the panel now, Charlie, Bob, Jillian, Juan, happy Sunday. There are those in this town who are saying this was the worst week yet for this president. Well, I remember the debate over John McCain and the Gold Star families and Access Hollywood. I, I, my question would be, is this week any different? Juan. Well, you know, it does seem like this presidency has been around for more than eight months, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting tired of all the winning. The winning is just driving me nuts. But, I, but you're right. I mean, it is a weak moment. If you look at the poll numbers, which is what I would look at, I'd say this president's astonishingly low for a man who's just elected less than a year ago. But it's a historical low, right? Is it not? It's a historic, well, you, it depends if you, it's not a historical low versus all presidents, Jillian, but it's a historical low in terms 
terms of a man who's been in office for seven Six plus months. months. Yeah. It's just that we've never seen that. So that in that sense, low. But you're right. I mean, it just seems to be like one thing after another. I, I feel like a fire hydrant's hitting me sometimes. You said he's a great quote giver and newsmaker. It's nonstop. And I used, we talk about John Kelly, the chief of staff, trying to get control. Can he get control? Well, we're going to see. Man? We're going to see about that as as this issue moves forward. But I, I think this is the normal for Washington now, uh, and we'll see whether or not that changes. Bob is shaking his head in disagreement. Uh, well, I, I think this is different. I think uh, uh, President Trump's uh, remarks post Charlottesville really show and suggest that he does not understand what it's like to be black, Hispanic, or a minority in America. Now, that's he a strong, has said that's a strong that, statement. Well, yes, but that's uh, from the words. It is provable. Now, people who know him best and work with him say this is not Trump. This is not really what he believes. Okay, the president, uh, having uh, reported on these things, controversies, scandals for 45 years, this is something that doesn't go away. It needs to be clarified. He needs to say in a very straightforward way, this is what I believe and this is why. There is a role, uh, and we all know this, for idealism in the American presidency. He needs to tap into that. He, his n nature is to be a fighter, a combatant. This is something where he can, uh, at least those who know him best will say, he is, and he has said himself, he is not a racist. He is not anti, uh, an anti-Semite. Okay, those words uh, are really uh, shocking. When I heard those, I have thought, this is the President of the United States talking? There's a way to clarify and tap into that idealism. But, but to, let, to let walk come away back. from yeah. it uh, is not Let me enough. come back to that. Charlie from Facebook, Donna writes the following. How on earth can he be expected to unite the country when the media, Democrats, liberals, never Trumpers, etc., keep pounding away at every word he says and doesn't say? That reflects exactly what his supporters think and feel. Sure. Today, and likely the president. And, and also for the previous eight years, uh, it's not like we had a president who did a very good job of uniting the country. Uh, after uh, unfortunate incidents uh, like this. Um, and, and the president has made very clear that he has denounced these evil groups uh, with no, in no uncertain terms. Uh, and so the idea that he hasn't done that is, is strange to me. I, I grew up uh, down in Virginia, not far from Charlottesville. Uh, literally my entire life, uh, we have argued about these statues. And uh, I can tell you that never, in, I cannot remember a single time when it, was, it ever became violent. Or, you know, their tempers flare, uh, people are very passionate about it, but there aren't racists and there aren't, you know, it, the, the, not, the, these people that came from the outside to create this this mayhem in Charlottesville, they're the only ones winning right now. And it's very, very bad for our country. And this notion, and, and we have a, an entire party that is built on the notion that America is a racist place. And it's not. And it's a very damaging thing to, to, to uh, perpetuate. When I, I covered Detroit Public Schools for, for five years. And when I think of a black kid in Detroit Public Schools, being told, given the message from day one, that this is a racist country, you'll never survive because of the color of your skin, you are sentence, sentencing that child uh, to, uh, to, to a very bleak future. The truth is that, that we have problems, we have disagreements, but we are, this is the freest, best country on earth with unlimited opportunities. And to tell a kid anything other than that, I think is about as bad as racism. Very well stated. Very well stated. Juan, we talk about race a lot, you and I personally, um, and we have for a decade now. Uh, the Democrats and the left have offered a lot of criticism this past week. Where is the message of unity from Democrats coming now, other than throwing more daggers and more critiques at what they perceive is happening now. Well, I think it has to be that you stand up and when you see something in, that is morally wrong, 
And I think the president's words when he came back and said, you know, that, you know, both sides have some blame here, suggested an equivalence that many people don't buy into. So yesterday in Boston, you saw an incredible turnout of people saying we stand against the message coming from the alt-right, from the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. Uh, when you see the CEOs of major companies pull away from the president, despite the arguments over tax reform that are coming, that's a pretty big sign. And when you see the heads of the U.S. military units come out and say, we are unified, we do not buy into any of these messages, don't confuse what the president said with what we're saying, I think that's a pretty strong message that they feel that if you look back to 9-11 President Bush or you look at after the challenge disaster, Ronald Reagan, that somehow this moral moment was a failure for President Trump. He did not represent what Bob Woodward was calling our nation's ideals, that somehow that sense of common bond was a failure. So for Democrats to call it out is energizing their base bill. Jen, uh, Jillian, I want you to respond to this. This takes us back to late fall 2015, candidate Trump. Watch. I'm going to unify. This country is totally divided. Barack Obama has divided this country unbelievably. And it's all, it's all hatred. What can I tell you? I've never seen anything like it. Now, I'm going to unify the country. I'll be a unifier. I think I'll bring people together. And that includes blacks and whites and everything. I think people will come together. So that was October, November 2015. Two tweets late yesterday afternoon from the president. Our great country has been divided for decades. Sometimes you need protests in order to heal, and we will heal and be stronger than ever before. He went on with regard to Boston yesterday afternoon. I want to applaud the many protesters in Boston who are speaking out against bigotry and hate. Our country will soon come together as one. Jillian, what do you make of that now? So the media largely accused the president this week of dithering in his response to what happened in Charlottesville last week. But I actually disagree with that analysis of the situation. I think President Trump made a calculated strategic decision about how he was going to approach what had happened and what his response was going to be like. Unfortunately, it was misguided. I think it was a miscalculation. But if you're the president of the United States and you're facing a nation that is internally divided, that is warring among itself, I think there's two options in front of you. One is you can try and bring unity by, and this is appropriate in certain situations, by saying, you know what? Everybody shares a certain burden here. Everybody factors into the blame. There is nobody who gets out of this scot-free without blood on their hands, without culpability. The other, the other approach you can take here is to try and bring unity by standing firmly with one side. And President Trump this week tro chose the former. And I think that was a huge strategic mistake. But I don't think that analysts do a service to what happened by accusing him of not thinking through this, of dithering and equivocating. I think he just or made a racist. miscalculated move. I'm trying to Perhaps figure out, of being racist. you know, and Perhaps Charlie, with regard to your far. comments from earlier, where the monument issue goes ultimately. Cindy writes on Facebook, Bob, the following. Yes. Why not sit in the Oval Office and speak from the heart about this issue? All right, that goes back to your point. Is yes. that something you would... Exactly, but, but this is not about monuments. This is about not just the words of the president, but his fundamental attitude. And uh, you're absolutely right. This is a miscalculation, and it's actually more than a miscalculation. Now, the danger in this for critics of the president, people in the media, Democrats, and as is pointed out, many, many Republicans are not standing with the president on this, and some of his most severe critics are Republican. But the tone cannot be self-righteousness. Oh, Oh, we get it, you don't get it. There can't be, and unfortunately there often is, this kind of smugness, oh yeah, I've got it right. Uh, I think we need to all step back from that. And uh, the president needs to seize that opportunity, whether you call it a mistake or a miscalculation. We're gonna leave it there. Charlie, thank you. Bob Woodward, Jillian, Juan Williams, thanks to all of you for thank being you here on this Sunday. In a moment, our power player of the week. Washington saying goodbye to one of its biggest celebrities. When you've been making delicious... Four years ago, the National Zoo welcomed